Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We are recording this podcast on October the 5th, 2020. Thanks so much for joining us today. As we have done before on this program, we're going to again highlight the management and prevention of COVID-19. Dr. Greg Poland is with us here again today. He's one of our favorite experts. He is a virologist, vaccine expert, and infectious disease specialist at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks for being with us again, Dr. Poland. And one of the first questions that you know has been talked about is that underlying conditions can affect how patients, how severely ill patients become from COVID-19. Why is it that things like obesity and high blood pressure increase your risk uh, if you're diagnosed with COVID-19? Obesity is a state of chronic immunosuppression. And so that's going to worsen one's ability to fight off an infection. Hypertension, completely different story. In this case, the uh, uh, COVID virus is actually infecting cells responsible for how our blood pressure and fluids are regulated. Uh, When we get to asthma, yet a different story. Here, we're talking about the virus attacking cells that are also affected by asthma and potentially by the treatments used for asthma. So it, it really depends. You know, in, in, in the case where we're seeing uh, more severe disease and more deaths, in general are in men over the age of 65 who have these other morbidities that you're talking about. Obesity being sort of an immune compromising uh, diagnosis. Why? And are there other comorbidities that patients could have that also cause them to have that sort of immune compromise? Patients who are, for example, uh, receiving treatment for cancer or who are on steroids or uh, patients with autoimmune diseases that are taking a variety of monoclonal antibodies and cytokine inhibitors, all of those have the propensity to lower our immune status. With obesity, it's an interesting thing and and a lot of work still going into this given how prevalent this is in in the United States and other developed countries. It affects virtually every arm of immunity. And so when you look at uh, other viral infections, uh, influenza notably, we see the same kind of thing. And so they're just not able to mount an effective uh, antibody response and not overdo the innate immune response. It's, it's what's been called an in chronic hyperinflammatory state. That already happens with COVID-19 infection. So you add the two together. The other thing, of course, is that um, the, the more weight on the chest, for example, and the upper abdomen, the more difficult it is to fully expand the lungs. Uh, as you know from your own work, uh, the ability to ventilate particularly somebody morbidly obese, uh, has resulted in some changes, including prone ventilation. So a lot of different mechanisms that go into it. Last Friday, after we learned of his diagnosis, we heard that uh, President Trump had had received a Regeneron antibody cocktail. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, this is really interesting. and, And actually, I think a very promising therapy. So what Regeneron did is they screened a whole variety of human and humanized mouse antibodies, and they selected two of them, the two that are included in the so-called antibody cocktail that Regeneron is developing. What's interesting about these two is that they non-competitively bind two different areas of the receptor binding domain of the virus. Now, let me put that into kind of lay terms. So this virus on the S protein has a what's called the receptor binding domain. This is the piece that actually inserts into the ACE2 receptor of a human cell. What these two antibodies do is block in two different places the ability of that virus to infect the cell. Um, and what's really interesting is that depending on how high your viral titer is, so you know it's worse if you have very high viral titers, the antibody cocktail works even better, reducing that those antibody uh, uh, levels, I'm sorry, not the antibody, the viral levels, by as much as 99%. So, so a very promising therapy. What's unusual at this point is that it doesn't even have emergency use authorization yet. 
but I suspect that's coming. So basically we can think of this drug as sort of attacking the little viruses and not letting the viruses attack us so much. Right, and basically it, 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 it attaches onto that virus so that the virus cannot bind to a cell. And it's very effective in doing that in these early studies. Tell us, is that different, Greg, than uh, what we've heard about, about the convalescent plasma that's been used? Yeah, well, it's, it's very similar in principle. What convalescent plasma does is it's now taking antibodies to all the different parts of the virus, including the S protein and including that receptor binding domain. And then uh, by the same mechanism, blocking the ability of the virus to uh, enter into the cell and inactivating it. I think the difference with the monoclonal antibodies is that's very narrow focused and specific uh, therapy and doesn't run the pretty uncommon and rare risks of transfusing plasma into somebody. The other drug that we've been hearing a lot about again is remdesivir. Um, can you tell us again what remdesivir is and how it works? I know we've discussed this in the past. This one is a, a different mechanism. This is what's called a nucleoside analog. And what that means is that any DNA or RNA material is composed of four building blocks. What remdesivir does is it acts like one of those, adenosine. And so it's a fake building block, if you will. And the enzyme that's responsible for piecing together the building blocks that make the RNA of the virus, it sees remdesivir, thinks it's one of the building blocks, inserts it into the virus's RNA genetic material, and then stops further development of that virus. It blocks it right then and there. It's not perfect. And as you know, it's available by EUA. What's a little disconcerting about remdesivir is there have been uh, three major trials. They have mildly differing results. And I, I guess the way I would think about it is remdesivir uh, seems to offer some benefit. That benefit has not been seen across all the trials. It seems to decrease the amount of time to, to recovery. It's not been clear that there's a mortality benefit. So a lot more work that needs to be done there. Not all of these antiviral medications work on all viruses. So for instance, I'm thinking of like the Tamiflu that we use for the flu, for instance. Yeah. Um, is there something very specific about these viruses? It's the differences in how the antivirals work and you're right, the specifics of the virus. So, you know, let's just take the uh, monoclonal antibodies that we talked about from Regeneron. Those were actually developed for SARS and MERS. And, you know, those disappeared pretty quickly, but they seem to be effective there. So this is an example, uh, just like remdesivir, of a drug, or in the case of some of the front runner vaccines, that were being developed 15 plus years ago, then kind of shelved because there weren't any more cases. And now are being pulled off the shelf, so to speak, and being repurposed. That's why they're the front runners. That's why we have these available. Uh, how much more difficult this would all be if we were starting from uh, zero. The, the one drug where that's not true is dexamethasone or steroids. Now, this is a, a really interesting drug because it's cheap, it's widely available, for the most part, uh, without significant side effects that we aren't already aware of. In the UK, a, a very good clinical trial was done called the recovery trial. And in this case, what they found is that mortality could be reduced by anywhere from 20 to 30% by the use of dexamethasone. So this is a drug that has two major effects, an anti-inflammatory, meaning it decreases those cytokines that can cause cytokine storm, which are too exuberant and actually can cause disease, and it's mildly immunosuppressive. So it decreases the activation of some of the immune cells that can lead to cytokine storm like macrophages. So that drug, I think we have pretty clear cut benefit and uh, I think is uh, uh, very appropriate for use in people who have severe disease or who are requiring supplemental oxygen. You use the term cytokine storm. What should that mean to our uh, listeners? 
Yeah, so what happens is when we get infected with a virus or a bacteria, our innate immune system, this is like an immediate reflexive uh, sort of attack on, that, on those viruses, sees that viruses, recognizes it as an invader, and starts releasing chemicals called cytokines. If you release too little, you won't develop an effective immune response. If you release too much, you can actually tip over into disease. It's kind of what we call the uh, case of Goldilocks here. You need not too much, not too little, but just enough. And then you need that to turn off once you have an effective antibody response. Cytokine storm means that those cells are, for a variety of reasons, producing too many danger signals. And actually, what's supposed to be beneficial gets tipped over into causing disease itself and harming the body. Three different uh, types of treatment that work in three different ways. Remdesivir, monoclonal antibodies, dexamethasone. Since they all work in different ways, is it common to uh, receive all of them? The, the one thing I should say again about the Regeneron, the monoclonal antibodies, <clears throat> is those are not yet available for emergency use authorization. So, you know, you, you might see those used in the context of a clinical trial. That's appropriate. But you wouldn't see that in widespread, you know, use in, in a hospital unless they were doing a clinical trial. I think when you get to the case of somebody who is deteriorating, with SARS-CoV-2 infection. They're now having blood pressure problems. They're now having to receive supplemental oxygen or even be intubated. And how far back we can move those therapies is unclear right now. Absolutely appropriate, I think, at this point in the science to consider convalescent plasma, remdesivir, dexamethasone as evidence-based ways of trying to help and not harm. One of the things that I've been amazed by uh, during this COVID, last nine months or so of this COVID pandemic, are how quickly teams have worked together. So mm -hmm. for instance, contact tracing, trying to figure out where someone was and who else they came in contact with, which in the case of someone who's running for re-election and busy with lots of uh, state mm -hmm. uh, affairs and things like that, seems like it would be very difficult. How practically does contact tracing work? So once somebody receives a positive diagnosis of COVID infection, that then gets reported to that state or, and or federal public health agency, okay? State Department of Health in, in the case of Minnesota. Then what happens is that they have contact tracers. They would, let's say I got a diagnosis like that. They would call me and say, okay, in the two to three days preceding your diagnosis, were you around anybody for more, they use 15 minutes, and closer than six feet, okay? So anybody that was around me, they would then take that name and any contact information I have, and they would contact them. They wouldn't say, oh, you were around Greg Poland. They would say, you were known to have been around. So. So the patient's anonymity is protected. That's an important thing because a lot of people have not been compliant with this because they're afraid they'll be targeted in some way. This is anonymous. What would happen is that they would ask you to get a test. They would educate you, indicate where you could get a test, and they would ask you to quarantine for 14 days or 10 days after your own positive test if that were to happen. So you might imagine what the difficulty is. Well, we're at over 7 million cases in the U.S. Imagine how difficult it was. You start with one and it branches out to 50 or 100 or sometimes even more than that. And they're trying to track each one of those down. And then if they become positive, then you're tracing their contacts down. It's very effective. It actually turns out to be very effective, but it's something that's most effective when you start very early in the outbreak. Once you're up to hundreds of thousands and millions of cases, it becomes just logistically very difficult. Well, we have something on a lighter note to ask you about. Our producer seems to dig up these fascinating topics for us. I think she's curious about them herself, but 
there does seem to be some evidence that the pandemic is affecting our dreams. Mm. What do you make of that? Well, I would say in, in, in my own case, that uh, has really been true. And in the case of friends and patients, that has been true. And what this is, is a manifestation all the way from all of our collective anxiety about this disease, about the risk of catching it, about what might happen to us, all the way to interfering with sleep, causing insomnia, which has its own set of problems, and even moving further and for some people into a sense of hopelessness and despair and even depression as a result of that. So we've seen things like insomnia, anxiety, people may be a little more touchy. Um, you ask somebody about wearing a mask and they, you know, we hear about people getting punched in the nose or something. There's probably an element of that. Domestic violence, unfortunately, and use of uh, uh, alcohol at record levels. So, so this has definitely happened. In my own case, um, I would say probably most every night I have some kind of COVID-related dream. And uh, I had quite a doozy of one on Friday as I was trying to, in my, in my own dream, collect together all the medical assets and my colleagues at Mayo Clinic that would be needed to care for a critically ill patient. And somehow I just couldn't get it arranged. And <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's been, a, there's been a lot of fascinating work on this. In part, some of these dreams are, have as a, their function our own continued subconscious working out of what would we do in what situation? How should we think about it? Um, and in other cases, we can't really explain uh, why it happens. I think in my case, it's, you know, I'm, I'm spending 16 hours a day on, on COVID. So it's not surprising that I carry it into my sleep. You know, some of my patients describe having dreams where they find themselves indoors in a crowded setting and realize they forgot their mask. And, you know, I think that at, at a certain level, that can provide a helpful stimulus of beginning to make normal at the subconscious level, new ways of living and new behavioral patterns. But the serious side, and I, and I do want to be serious here for a moment, the serious side I think of it is if somebody's experiencing insomnia and if that's starting to lead to a sense of anxiety or hopelessness, that is a reason, a reason just as important as COVID to talk with your healthcare provider and see what, if anything, needs to be done and how we can be helpful. Thanks again to one of our favorite specialists, Dr. Greg Poland, for being with us and sharing COVID updates today. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish you a wonderful day. Be safe. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.